Valentine's. Here we are. Yes. We had the singing Valentine. We had amazing worship. Uh, just a beautiful time in God's presence where Holy Spirit walked in and just ministered specifically to many of you who may not have expected that God even knew where you were on the planet. And we're grateful that God allows us the freedom to be able to move with whichever direction that he wants to. But we know that love is always on his heart, that his very heartbeat is that he would be the communicator to us, his people, those that are far off, those that are near, that He, his intent is to communicate that love. So that's actually where we're launching into now. We've actually got a, a message, Valentine, for you today. Is that okay with you, church? Amen. It's going to be an awesome time. Amen. So let's Amen. pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you, that you've made. Father, you've made it for us to rejoice and to thank be you, glad Lord. in it. And Father, we are so glad that all of this is about you and the love that you have for us. Thank you thank for you, proving Father. it. Without a shadow of a doubt, it is signed, sealed, and delivered through the thank blood you. of your your son who came and stood in our place and bore our uh, the the effects of our sin upon his body he was crucified raised and is living now father as our, as the one who's made a way for us to be one with you with him and with the holy spirit it is to you father we give praise it is to you we throw open the our, the doors of our hearts to receive all that you have for us today in Jesus name amen amen, amen. amen. so as pastor and i've been we we look forward to this month from uh, actually, from year to year, we begin to look forward to the things that we know that God has placed in our heart to be able to share with you as an encouragement that God is for you, that he wants to display his love for you, whether you're single, whether you're married. Uh, we want to make sure that you know that if you are single or if you um, have recently uh, experienced some sort of a separation or even recently a divorce, you are his beloved. And these messages are for you, for you to be encouraged. So whether you already have a fantastic marriage or you just one day would like to be married or you th you have a grace on your life to be single, I don't understand that, but I, I bless you in Jesus' name because <laughs> there are some that really are grace for that. But we don't want, so we don't want you to think this message would not be for you. But as we were praying and as we were preparing again for months and months looking into this day, I really felt like God gave me absolutely like dictation. And so in order to honor that, if it's okay with you, I'd really love to just read to you really as it were the Valentine straight from your father's heart. Is that okay? Amen. Sounds great. Um, Pastor and I this morning are privileged today to personally deliver your Valentine from the lover of your soul. Today's message could have very easily been pinned on fine parchment perfumed linen paper, as romantic as it is. It's intimate, passionate, and powerful. Your Valentine message on this 14th day of February from your beloved. Let me get my glasses on because I'm still believing for my healing. <laughs> I was just doing it by faith. Here we go. <laughs> it's in process. It's in process. <laughs> oh, the heart. Okay. Valentine's Day, the 14th of February, 2016, represents the eternal heartbeat of God deliberately aimed at stirring your Lo your, I'm sorry, your wholehearted response, okay, for it is time, actually high time, for the beloveds of God to begin loving extravagantly and with absolute abandon. Our message inscribed in crimson red today is love life. How is your love life? That's the probing question that can make Valentine's Day more torturous than romantic. Our love life is a subject that can evoke everything from giddy joy to morose depression. Why is that? It's because we're born with an inbred expectation to be loved. We're created to thrive if we love and are loved, and we suffer if love is withheld. Any day, church... Any day in a life without love is unsettling. But Valentine's Day reminds us that either something is marvelously right or horribly wrong. Our innate longing for a life filled with love comes from the ultimate love story of creation. As Christians living in our predestined time and space here in Fayetteville, we're no different from Adam and Eve who were implicitly designed to re 
present God on the earth. They were fashioned from the very substance of God, wherein they would imitate him as dear children of God. That's Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. His thoughts and feelings and purposes were instilled into them by his word and the instruction as well as by his example as he walked with them in the cool of the day. Their behavior and attitudes were not forced upon them. They were gifted with free wills, which by definition assign validity and value to any love relationship. They were lavishly loved, given wisdom, and perfectly provided for as an example. They were entrusted with stewardship of one another's heart and their realm of influence. Genesis narrates both a perfect standard of love, love's original intent, intent, yet it also relates the catastrophic tragedy of God's betrayal. Even Eve turned her affections toward the fruit forbidden out of God's love for the young lovers and then offered her pleasure to her husband who joined her in mutiny. Their love and all of mankind's love was maligned. Their pure love was ruined by guilt, which immediately caused them to be tormented with a fear of judgment. In Genesis 3, we find them hiding behind crude attempts to hide their shame. Trembling behind trees when their adoring father arrived for their evening stroll. They had been warned that they would die if they ate of the tree. The spiritual death of sin that they experienced brought the separation from the lover of their souls. With one decision, the two were hurled into chaos. They weren't thinking straight. Their knowledge of their God or of perfect love was eclipsed by a tormenting fear of judgment. God is eternally omniscient and omnipresent. He was well aware of his creation sin against him. Notice He didn't hurl brimstone into the garden or appear suddenly in place of the tree they were huddled behind, lift them up by their necks and shake them. No, he came in his usual way to meet with them. He could have said, Adam, I know you're hiding. I know what you did. You'll never see me or hear from me again. And he could have abandoned them exactly as they had departed from his goodness to serve their own lust. God had to have been devastated knowing that they had denied his love and loved a temporary pleasure more. But also he had to have been brokenhearted knowing that the hardship and struggle that they now would face because sin was now lording over their lives rather than his love. What if they were sowing their sad attempts to cover their sin with those leaves? What if they had reasoned instead according to their knowledge of God's goodness? What if they had wept and said, Oh no, uh, we've done wrong. We've hurt the one who's done nothing but love us. Let's go searching for him to tell him what we've done and tell him how sorry we are. What if they'd humbled themselves in the garden and began to cry out, Father, Father, forgive us. We've done wrong. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how this would wound us and hurt you. Oh, God, forgive us. We want to come back to you. Heal us, O God. Instead, they shifted blame and attempted to justify their sin. Instead, they were left with desolation and their love life laying in ruins. The only love that was untainted was our God's. In his great love, he revealed even then how Jesus would come into captivity would come, I'm sorry, that Jesus would come in the fullness of time seeking to save all those whose lives were lost and were sold into captivity by Adam and Eve's lust for the thing God had explained was going to ruin their life.
their love life. And the other thing we have to look at, and, and most people know the story of when Adam and Eve fell. And then in um, Genesis, the third chapter, we see exactly how all of that uh, came together. We, we see Satan coming into the garden. Uh, we see how he uh, appealed to Eve concerning, to both of them, because both of them were there, uh, concerning the lust of the flesh, uh, the way that the, the eyes were looking, uh, when she saw that the fruit was good, how it would give them wisdom. Uh, the devil knew what he was doing. That's, that's, that's how he actually came and deceived one third of the angels in heaven to get them to follow him. He, he carries the same identical mode of operation right into the garden. And so, so the, the, what we need to look at here is this. The devil put together a temptation, put together something that he felt that would work. And as he did that, and Adam and Eve uh, sinned, Adam and Eve went for it, for the temptation. And then that division, that separation uh, came in. When we look at that, we look at that many times as, okay, that was in the Garden of Eden, that was in history. Right. But he still operates yes. in the same manner and the same way sure to try to bring temptation into our lives, to try to divide us, to get us into a place of strife, jealousy, uh, envy. Uh, he, he wants to do everything he can to cause us to offend one another. Uh, so that uh, he can move in and bring division and confusion into our lives. He doesn't change the way he does things. And the reason he doesn't change it is because it works too well. Yeah. And then, and then when, when Adam and Eve, who had dominion, when, when they gave over that dominion to Satan, the Bible tells us that he literally became the little g God of this world. And so as he took Adam's dominion, He began to put together the systems of this world, the kingdoms of this world. And he put it together and he glamorized it. Oh, he he, he made it look like it was the meaning of life. He, he, He put together the principles and the systems in this world to get our attention. And it made it look so glamorous that we would go after that thinking that that's the meaning of life. And the reason that we go after things like that and we think that it's the meaning of life is because we've lost our reference points of what life is all about. We've literally been separated from our identity and separating from the one who created us. So therefore, Adam and Eve now are reverting to looking for their identity, trying to find purpose and meaning in life within this world structure. The devil comes in and puts this whole structure together. And and, and even when he tempted Jesus, he said... I can bless you if you'll just worship me. Because he said, see, all of this that I'm showing you is mine, and I can give it to anybody that I want to. I can bless whoever I want to. And he comes in and puts these systems together, and he blesses people, and we get our eyes on them, and we look and say, wow, that, I want that, I want this, I want that. I want to have all of those particular things. So the very temptation that he used for Adam and Eve... To fall in the garden is the same temptations that he uses today in this world system. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us. Listen to what it says in 1 John, the second chapter, verse 15. John is speaking in, amen, shout for the word. He says, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Now, he did not say you can't enjoy the things in the world. Right. Okay, there's a big difference. The word love here, when he says do not love the things of this world, that is the same word that he uses when we say we love God. Wow. See, we've got to understand what love really is, true love, what the love life really is. Because here's the way we do things. I love God. I love ice cream. I love my dog. I love my dog. I love Love my my cat. I love, you know, that's what we think. We just lump it all together. But that's not what that's not what he says. He says this type of love is a love that your heart is totally 100 percent into it to a place that it becomes number one in your life. Mm. 
So that's the reason he says, don't love this world. And when he talks about the world, he's not, ta- he's not talking about just the, the geographical earth. Right. Okay, he's talking, to, he's talking about the systems and the principles and the things that the devil himself has put together to lead us away from Jesus or to tempt us to get in to sin. So he said, don't love the world or the things of this world. The same identical thing when he says this, the love of money is the root of all evil. He didn't say money was the root of all evil. Right. He said, it's the love of it. That the, for the love of it, it causes us to do crazy things. And so he says, don't love the world and the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, he's saying this. If I love the world more than I love Jesus, more than I love, the, 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 the I love God, then I have suppressed that love. I have taken the love that I have for God and I have put it secondary okay. when it's supposed to be primary. So he says, for all that is in the world. Now, now remember, the devil has put all of this together in the world, okay? He's the one who has arranged this. And he says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. This stuff right here. Yeah. Here's what we as Christians need to understand. Because a lot of times we will have feelings and impulses and desires that pop up. We can see something. We can hear something. All of a sudden, there's a rush. There's a feeling that comes with that. And here's what you and I have to understand. Our feelings are not us. That's right. That is not the real us. That is this corrupt flesh that we live in. This flesh has not been saved. Okay? That's the reason it it calls it corrupt. This flesh cannot be redeemed. Matter of fact, when, if, if we're here when Jesus comes and we all go up uh, uh, alive to meet him in the air, this body is going to totally change. Okay? And, Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. Amen. So, so, so it's the lust of the flesh. So if the lust of the flesh is one of the tools that the devil uses, then he's got to create something out here to stir up the lust in here. Okay? And if you don't do something about it when that thought or that feeling comes, if you don't do something about it right then, it's going to establish a root system. And then it's going to establish a stronghold. And it can get, it can get so strong that you become addictive. Right. It can get so strong that you become a slave to it. And that's what it's designed for. That's what the devil designs it for. So he said that's the reason Jesus came to set us free and give us power on the inside. So that we don't have to live and, and identify ourselves yes. by the impulses yes. and the desires that pop up on the inside of us. That's when I said no in the name of Jesus. No. Every single one of you have a delete button on your computer. There you go. Yes. Turn to your neighbor and say delete it. Delete it. Amen. You, you can't pray and say, God, please delete this from me. Lord, please delete this from me. And the Lord says, oh, okay. Mm-mm. No, no, no. He's given us the power. We have the responsibility. When something pops up, boom, delete it. Get it gone. Something comes in your mind, cast it down. Rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Feeling comes up in this flesh, you say, Uh Uh-uh, no way. No way. I I can say that in Spanish. No way, Jose. You're not (laughs) you're not going to do it. Amen. I'm not going there. You're not taking me there. And so he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and here's the biggie, the pride of life. Pride. Yeah. Yeah. Pride. All selfishness stems from pride. And that's the reason the Bible says do nothing out of selfish ambition. We're to have passion. We're to have ambition. But we're not to do it for self. The, the biggest problems that we have in marriages today is because somebody or two, it doesn't matter, somebody selfish. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. Meet my need. That's what you're here for, woman. Meet my need. That's what you're here for, man. Meet my need. You know, Nobody except God can meet your deepest spiritual need. Right. Nobody can fill this except for God himself. That's the reason if you try to make marriage work outside of a relationship with Jesus, or you can make it work, but it's going to end up empty. But when you put Jesus, when two people are, ser- two people are really spending time with the Lord individually, 
when we come together, that love that both of us are developing in our lives, a threefold cord is not easily broken. Jesus is right in the middle. So that's, that's the reason that, that pride, it says the world is passing away and the, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Pride. Pride is self-centeredness. Pride is choosing to please myself whenever I know that God has called us to a life of servanthood. Jesus displayed that. He was that answer who stepped onto the scene in the fullness of time when God sent his son Jesus Christ to bridge the gap, to cause us to be able to enter back into the intended love relationship that we have with him. The intended purpose there was to put us and set us in order so that as we served God, as we loved him with all of our heart, it was going to his, his heart was going to be mirrored back into us and so therefore we would be empowered to both resist sin but also to prefer another person to to want to promote their good for uh, uh, with everything that we could instead of constantly looking how things could benefit us making choices that would bring pleasure to our God because we're getting to exemplify him and what we're doing this very answer that God has given us through the Lord Jesus Christ now the Holy Spirit living inside of us that's the best news we could possibly have because even though as pastor has said and noted that our flesh does not get born again it's so good to understand that but it's even better to understand that we've been given the greater one who lives inside of us who's delivered us not just transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness where we were held under the sway and the slavery of sin where selfishness made us uh, informed all of our decisions caused us to be ruthless caused us to be selfish caused us to be gossipers caused us to uh, uh, pull others down, to promote ourselves, to make ourselves look better. And, and it, all of that, bringing down the lordship of God in any way that we act like that way, in any time that we act that way, we're actually demoting God in our own view because that's not the way that he would treat the situation. Amen? So through Christ Jesus, when him coming, Holy Spirit living inside of us, it was for this reason. It was to create a temple inside of our hearts first. He had a plan for the church always from the beginning of time that his bride would be his people formed together that would be acting out the love of God, exemplifying, uh, re-presenting God and his love to the earth. But it first has to happen in each one of us as individuals. He is in our very own temples, the the, uh, the, uh, sanctified inside of our hearts. And that's where he does that work and begins to transform our thinking. And we're no longer prideful, but we are, uh, uh, we are uh, laying our lives down before him, finding ourselves so richly rewarded, so satisfied in this love light that we are transformed. And then, then we quickly began to transfer that over and that runs over and affects the relationships in the world around us, whether it be a spouse, our children, our co-workers, the ones that we're going to school with, we become selfless and we want to promote the good and the, which is them finding God, them experiencing God through us. So then from that, consequently, God's mind was, the plan from the very beginning was then he would form his church. And that's where we want to step back into scripture here at this point in time is because though we saw Adam and Eve and how they represent us in the same types of of, um, uh, uh, lustful appetites that could be also stirred in us by the uh, manipulation of Satan if we're not wise to him, we also want to look at that and the impact of the church because as we pick up here in Acts 4 and going into verse 5 a little bit. We're going to look at one of the first couples, one of the first church couples that were that were introduced to us when the church of Christ was birthed in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit had come. It had revolutionized all of those who had had known Jesus and they were born again and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly this beautiful church was birthed. And that's where we're going to step in at this point and look at the condition of the church. But you 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 also as as Tava prepares to read this, you also must must understand and see that this couple that you're going to see is a born again, right, born again. spirit filled, water baptized right. couple in the church as it just started, move of God, 3,000 people saved, Revival. God adding to the church daily, but then the devil put something in their hearts and in their minds to lead them astray, and it brought destruction. Watch this. So look there with me in Acts 4, starting with verse 31. Um, 
It says, and when they, the church, had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. In verse 32, now the multitude of those who believed were of what? One heart, one heart, and of one soul. One soul means that they were collectively focused on one mind, one intent to promote the kingdom of God, to make Jesus Christ known, and to begin to display and to demonstrate the love of God that was within inside, inside of them. And, and, and see, here's, here, here's what the devil knows. The devil knows as long as... As we are united, there you go. One heart and one soul. What happens? Nothing can stop That's our right. vision. They were flourishing. He knows when a household, husband and wife, are one heart, one soul, in one accord, right. one mind, going in the same direction, he cannot stop it. Miracles are going to take place. Blessing is going to flow. And so he has got to do something to stop the move of God that's taking place right now. Verse 32, now the multitude of those who believed were of, again, one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Church history shows us that, of course, in that region, they were experiencing extreme persecution. That as they, as they would come forward and declare that they were Christians, that they were converted to Christianity, then they were ousted by society and by families. And so many of them were, uh, were, were stripped of their, not necessarily the possessions, but they were, they were excommunicated. They were excommunicated. From their no one wanted to shop in their businesses anymore. And so, because of that particular time and the challenges of that time, God gave them a strategy so that they actually shared their possessions. Those who had greater wealth brought that, and you'll see this in just a moment. But what I wanted you to look at here is that as they gave. Um, I'm sorry, it's a multitude of believed were one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. That also, too, is as God was doing these great things, it wasn't this great person did that and that great person did this and, oh, we're bragging about what we're doing. No, there was it was all shared together as God doing this work through his body and another, th- another indicator of the blessing of unity in the body of Christ. And with great power, the great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them all. That's huge blessing. Verse 34, nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the, the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which translates son of encouragement. I like that name. A Levite in the country of Cyprus, having land, this man sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the example of someone who acted righteously is one of the one, one of the names that is named of someone who both uh, was a godly man, had gotten born again, he's spirit-filled, he has a possession, he goes and he brings the proceeds from that possession and lays them at the feet of the apostles to be distributed, to be a blessing amongst all those that were in the body of Christ. Now watch this as... Um, um, and contrary to that example, in verse 1 it says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Now watch this because a lot of times this story or this account has been told in a way that makes people think, oh my goodness, you know, does God not want me to have my needs met? Does this mean that, that God is, is going to go after everything that I need? I'm not even going to be able to have my needs met? No, watch this. This explains it completely. Verse 4, while it remained, Peter said to Ananias, Was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. Notice, here's a key, okay? First of all, Satan didn't immediately fill his heart. This was a process. 
As this was going on, he and his wife were discussing this at home. First came the thought, well, why do we have to do this? Why do we want to do this? Okay, we've said we're going to do it, but then the plan was conceived. Okay? The Bible says in John the 10th chapter, it says, After supper, Satan putting into Judas' heart to betray Jesus. He put it into his heart. Satan put it into their heart to do something was totally, completely wrong. Totally contrary to what they had made a decision to do. And they had committed that to God. Okay? The moment that Satan came to put it into their heart, what is the first thing they should have done? Cast down that Come on, come on, talk to me. Everybody say it. Cast down. Cast it down. Cast it down. You're going to have thoughts that come into your heart concerning husband, wives. Those of you that are single, you're always going to have thoughts that are going to come into your mind that are contrary to the will of God. And you've got to, you've got to ask yourself, do I want to do this because I want, to, I want to impress people or I want to be accepted by people? Or do you say, uh-uh, no, first, no, I love God. And if I love God, I'm going to obey Him. I rebuke that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not going to do that. They didn't do that. So here's what happens. Okay? Here's what happens. You don't get pregnant until you conceive. The seed was sown. That seed should have been aborted. Right? That seed was sown. The more that they dwelled on the seed that was there, they conceived it and they got pregnant with the idea. And they gave birth. But what did they give birth to? They gave birth to sin. And the wages of sin is what? It's death. death. Well, and so Peter here, he, he makes such an important point to us here at Covenant Love in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We understand that God, God uh, positions each generation to fulfill his plan for those whose lives we are to impact. We're assigned a, a people. We're assigned something to our generation, whether Jesus comes back during our lifetime or whether it's another 200 years we have all been given this mandate, this great privilege to walk out with the plan and the strategies that God has for us in our region and the ones that we have influence over. And if you notice here, uh, Peter makes the point that you weren't, you weren't lying to man. You weren't lying to your church. You were lying to God. Why did they do this in front of their, their friends in church? Why do people come in on a Sunday morning and they're, they're acting like they're, um, they're kind and they're generous and they're, and they're loving and yet we're getting in the car and we're getting on the phone and we're mouthing off to someone or we're, we're putting down somebody at the church that we just saw we refuse to forgive. Why are we bringing ourselves forward continually as though we are godly, we are walking in the love of God and yet our heart have these things that are tucked away that we're not really giving notice to. We're like, well, this is normal. This is a part of life. I'm sure this little couple thought, well, hey, we're going to pay off some bills. But really, it's important about the way that we're presenting ourselves amongst ourselves in the body of Christ. We're perfect love. This love life should be knitting us together instead of causing us to have divisions. Amen. So just continuing here real quickly. Verse 5. Verse 5, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those, those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him and carried him out and buried him. Verse 7, now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said, tell me, Sapphira, whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they're going to carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, buried by her husband. So great, a great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. Now watch what's happened after this. Verse 12, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all, again, back with one accord 
in Solomon's porch. Yet none of them rest the rest dare join them, but the people esteemed them highly. What happened at that important critical time when the the church of God had been birthed, had been brought together by the power of the Holy Spirit. They had been sealed with the Holy Spirit. They'd been set on a mission. And it was a critical time because it was the early time of that church. It was so important that the purity of what God had established there was going to go forward and be multiplied. At this particular time, and, in, and really we need to be very sensitive to, the, sensitive to that, we recognize, we realize these are the final days that a great revival may very well move into our region just any time and we want to be positioned in the place so that we're right in sync with that holiness and walking in that pure love of God so that we again don't present ourselves as liars to the Holy Spirit but we are truly loving God and we're truly one, loving one another so thank God that he's not Ananias and Sapphira's are not dropping all over the congregation these days but we don't want to take it lightly knowing that as we make these decisions we, if we allow Satan to put something in our heart we move forward in it there's drastic ramifications that we need to consider. And, and the thing that we need to look at is this. The, the, the very sin that may be operating in our lives, the very things that are outside of the will of God, we need to let those things die and we yeah. need to pick them up, take them out of our house, and we That's need so to good. bury those suckers. Amen. We need to we need to get rid so of them. Good. Need to get rid of them. At least. And the reason God did this is because the church is just starting. That's right. He's just starting, and he's developing and showing them you need to honor and respect me. Uh, the the fear of the Lord, not a tormenting fear, but the but the but, but the fear of the Lord. But notice that the one thing that we look at that that was that caused all of this to take place is the same thing we deal with and deal with in our marriages or even if we're single and that is money yeah money it's a big deal it, it 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 because a lot of times we fall again the the devil has this set up for us we fall into this place We've been there. We have done this. We've fallen into the trap where we wanted to have things and have things quicker and, 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 and we want to have things to impress people. We want to, you know, have enough and go out and eat and do all those things. And what do we do? We put it on credit cards. Wow. Put it on credit cards. And we end up and putting more and more and more and more and more. And, and, and what, what happens? We, we start paying the minimum payment of $25 and we look the monthly interest of that just accumulated is 96 100 or whatever now we're in we're slaves yeah we're slaves to all of this no, and, we and, we're, and we're and we're going down why to to buy things and to get things and to do things to to what to impress people that don't even like you Amen. And, and all of a sudden, what we do is we have this need and this desire. I got to have more. I got to have more. I got to have more when we don't have the money to have it and to do it. And we put our families and we put our, our lives uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a position that we get into the pit. We get into the pit of debt. And, 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 and like I said, we've been there. We, we know what that feels like. But we also know what it is to say no Praise to going God. out to eat when I can't afford <laughs> to go out and eat. Yeah. I, we know what it is to say no to all of the things that we want. You know, I tell everybody all the time, if you go into the mall and you see something and, and, and that demon of get <laughs> jumps on you, all you have to do is go out to your car, walk away, back up very slowly, Walk away, go out to your car, sit in your car for 30 seconds and think about it. 99% of the time you won't go back in. Because it's that, oh, i got to have it. got to have it so right now. So beware how easy it is to yeah. get things online. So, so, so it, it, it's set up like that. It, 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 some people, all they do is watch the shopping network. It's and dangerous. sit there, i got to have that, i got to have that, i got to have that. Yeah. And, and houses, no, no, no. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the devil's trap. That's Making what he. Slaves to death. Thank you for one amen. This is the devil's trap. Yes. And listen, listen. <laughs> let, let, let me close with this. If, if you don't believe that this is one of his greatest areas, listen to what James says. And then we'll pray after this. Listen to yeah. this. 
Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? And the word desires for pleasure there means lusting for things. Does not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members. They war in here. Now now think about this. Who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to impress? There's, there's, there's nobody out there that really cares. That you, you, Television makes you want to buy that car. And you think when you buy that car, and there's nothing wrong with getting a car. okay? But when you buy it, you think that everybody, just like you see on television, is going to stop what they're doing on the sidewalk. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to look out. They're going to look outside of their business windows, throw it up, and they're going to stop and go. Like the commercials. Like, wow. And they're all going to do like that. And the moment you buy it and you drive it out, nobody, they don't even wave at you when you go off the thing. Nobody looks at you. No. I'm telling you, it, 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 it comes up in here. And it puts you in jeopardy. It puts your family in jeopardy. It puts everything in jeopardy. So he says this. Listen to this. They war in your members. You lust and do not have. You murder. And the word murder there means hate. You hate and you covet. Remember Psalm 73. Write that down in your notes. If you've never read it, read it. Because that is the praise and worship leader of King David. Inside uh, uh, of, of, of his whole worshiping God, the tabernacle, everything, uh, uh, ASAP, here's what he said. He said this. He said, I almost backslid when I saw the prosperity of the, of, of the wicked. Wow. He was affected by it so much, he said, I almost backslid. He said, you murder, you covet, and you cannot attain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Listen to this. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. That you may spend it on your pleasures. And then he goes on and he talks about when you have the love of the world and the love of money and that's what drives you. He, he calls us adulterers and adulteresses. That's what he says. But, here's the, but he comes back and says this. He says, but I will give more grace to the humble. Yes. He said, if, he said to the proud, he said, I, I bring frustration. I resist the proud. I bring frustration. So when we get into a place... That we're loving the world more than we're loving God and loving our families. And we're going after the things of the world more than that. Very seldom am I getting my prayers answered. Because of of what it says. Because my prayers are going out just so I can be selfish and have everything to myself. I'm not looking out here, how can I bless people? How can I do something? Because the Bible says do nothing out of selfish ambition. Even prefer one another before yourself. Serve one another like Jesus came and served. And, 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 and get that selfishness out of us. It's still here in this nature. But see, God lives in here now. Yes. The love of our soul lives in here now. Yes. We have the ability and the power on the inside of us to do what God's called us to do. And you know what he wants us to do? Instead of going out and trying to buy all this stuff for that we that we can't afford to buy. He just simply wants us to love each other. To love one another. Regardless if we have a bunch of stuff or not. Because he said that love that you have for one another. Is going to tell the whole world that you belong to me. You belong to me. And, and if you live like the world. The world's going to think you belong to, to, to them. And when we don't. We can't get caught up in this system. We can't allow the devil to tempt us and get us into a place where all of a sudden he's got us as slaves to debt underneath his system. And and we found out this. When we got honest with God and came before the Lord and said, Lord, we've got ourselves in a mess. And we just thank you for getting us out. And Lord, so his his question back to us is this. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to stop our spending. We're going to stop putting things on credit cards. 
We're going to start, we're going to get these suckers paid off no matter how long it takes us to pay off. And we're, we're going to do what is right. And what we found out in our lives is when we started doing that, sources started coming in from different areas to help right. us pay it pay off it quicker it than it. we could ever imagine. But we had, we had, and then the temptation was that once you get one yeah. paid off, <laughs> celebrate. We're going to go out, we're going to get stuff, we're going to do things. No, 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 no. You, you, no. That's where you say, thank you, Lord, for helping me. That's I'm going to tell freedom. you, we now know, we now know, because it took us years to do it, but we now know what it is to live free from that debt. And yes. I'm going to tell you, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it is much better. It, the sleep, the, the house, everything is much better when we do it God's way. And, and we get our focus on what it's what we're supposed to do. Can you say amen? amen? Let's all stand up if you would, please. Come on, let's just stand up. Thank you, Father. What a great I, I, want, I want to pray for you. But, I, but here's, you know, if, if I said, okay, I'm going to give an altar call right now. Every one of us, even Tave and I would come down. So, you, you know, we can give, you, you know, a lot of people pride themselves on, okay, we had this many people. Train. And there's nothing wrong with that. But as your pastor... Here's what we desire for you to do. You've heard the message. You know where you are in your own life. You you know where you are in your own heart. Don't be an Ananias and Sapphira. You know, don't 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 get off base. Don't let the devil take you and 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 take you out there and destroy your life, which he wants to destroy your marriage. Don't let him do that. I'll never forget the time as a man and as a husband that I, I, I'm, I didn't start out in our marriage being the person that you may think I am right now because I was a type A personality. I, I, I was driven. I was aggressive. I was competitive. You know, and it was all about where I wanted to go, my vision, what I wanted to do. And, and I was blessed to have a wife that would follow in, in, in with that. But there was times that I was really mean. There was times that I spoke down to her. Using my voice to try to control her. To try to submit to me. And, and intimidate her. There was times that because I wanted to do what I wanted to do because I was so selfish. I was born again spirit filled. Even working in ministry. But I was still selfish. And I, I, I remember that as a man, as, as God, and God loved me so much, He's long-suffering, He began to show me these things. And I, I remember as a man that I, this, this is what I did. I got down on my knees and I told the Lord, I said, God, please help me to understand your love, to know your love. God, I'm selfish. Lord, I can be a control freak. I seek for perfection and nobody can attain it, so I get mad and angry. God, help me. Lord, get this stuff out of me. Lord, help me to be the man that I need to be. Lord, I humble myself before you. I cannot do this myself. It's only by you that I can be everything that you've called me to be. And I'll never forget the day that I sat down and I went to her. I put her in a chair. And I said, forgive me for my anger. Forgive me for being mean. Forgive me for the way I've treated you. Forgive me for the way that I've spoken to you. Forgive me for the things that I've done selfishly. Please forgive me. Because I don't want that in our household. And of course, this woman is full. Her mercy and grace is all over her. And she forgave me. But I'll know this. The moment I did this, there was a peace in the presence of God that came in that house. Like I had not known since the day we got married. It was absolutely, it was absolutely amazing. You know, you may be standing here as a man, you just say, you know, well, You know, I couldn't do that. The only reason you can't do it is because you're still selfish. I can do it because I have died to myself. I've died to reputation. 
I've died to trying to be macho, macho. Be, be, I, nah, that stuff doesn't work. I died to that. And now the love that now that we have is greater, stronger than we've yeah, ever yeah. in our lives <laughs> had it before. Yes. It's doing that. But see, I want what God has for us. Yes. And, and I want all of it. And I want it in abundance. So I have no problem just dying to this pride that keeps me and tries to kill me. And I, I believe that's one of the reasons that women outlive men. Because we try to hold this image. We try to do this, all this stuff. And they, women, can let it loose and be emotional. Not us. We implode. We keep it in. So we shorten our lifespan. So I, I decided I ain't dying early. Amen, brother. You know? <laughs> I'm not going to die early. I'm not going to keep this stuff in. I'm going to be open and honest with my wife. And believe me, some people say, well, she would take advantage. No. I'm going to tell you right now. The Bible says love never fails. Love never fails. Love never fails. As your pastor, I'm open and transparent because I want you to walk in the path that God has for you. It doesn't matter to me what anybody thinks about me. I want to use what I made mistakes, the things that I did to get you in a position and a place that you'll have 34 years of marriage plus, plus. and keep right on going and let every and let everybody let everybody see, let everybody see that marriage God's way yes. is real, it yes. works, and it's wonderful. It's Can you say one. amen? I want you to just raise your hands if you would. For, just raise your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, yes, Tame Father. and I just come into agreement. Yes. And we pray over every single marriage and we Thank pray you, over Father. every single single person right now. Jesus. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that, Lord, that you would bless them. You would open yes. their eyes and let them see, Lord God, and understand what your love really is and what you, what you said, that you came to this earth not to be served, but to serve. And we're here Father. to serve one another. We're not here trying to prove our, as a man, machoism. And we're not here as, as the ladies to, to go out and just do whatever they want to do. And, you know, or either any of us, Father, to, to go Father. out and put our families in debt and do all kinds of things. Thank you, Father. And, Lord, I know we've been there before, but you got us out of it. Yes. Because we took responsibility for it. And I just pray right now that we will not blame shift like in the garden, but we will Thank take responsibility. Yes. And we will go to one another and we'll say, forgive me, because I, I haven't been doing what is right. And I pray we'll not be hiding secret things from one another. But Thank Lord God, Father. we just literally will open our hearts. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we will share and you, walk in unity and harmony. Sure. And in doing that... The devil is no match for us. Thank you, Lord. In doing that, we'll see miracles and your blessing yes. flowing into our lives like never before. So, Father, today we just say, and I say on behalf of our congregation, of any yes, of us, Lord. Lord God, that's been outside of your will or we've been walking out of love and yes, we've been Father. selfish or anything like that, Father, forgive us. We yes. repent right now in Thank the name you, of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I just pray for healing in our lives and in our marriages in the name of Jesus Christ thank you, Father. and Father we just thank you for it and we praise you for it in Jesus name we pray and everybody said Amen Amen can you say Amen